this is a Commodore 64. Behold, the nostalgia of the 80s. Thank you. So this is, it might look like an animated GIF of a Commodore 64 screen, but it is actually a, well, I say it's a fully functional Commodore 64. Oh yeah, I can type. So I can do things in here if I could spell, and it will actually run. Ah, if I can type, there we go. Okay, so it is a functional basic interpreter, uh, a functional Commodore 64. Uh, and the interesting thing about this is it is running in Chrome. So I can pull up the developer tools. I can go into the sources. I can pull up all the JavaScript that's involved and it just, it goes on for, it goes on for a ways. But what we are going to do is have a look, not at the source code. We are going to have a look at, uh, I'm going to have to drag this over there now. How is that going to work? Uh, we are going to have a look at the what and the wherefores of how you go about that. Let's see, let's see how this goes. If I press play, there we go. Perfect, right. So we have seen the demo of the Commodore 64 running in JavaScript. Why would you do such a thing? What is the point? Uh, there's the nostalgia factor, of course. Uh, I mean, I grew up playing Turrican, New Zealand Story, all of those kinds of games on the Commodore 64. But the most important thing here is that they say that if you want to learn something, the best way is to teach it. So if you're teaching a computer how to be a different computer or how to behave like a different computer, then you're learning something about computer design while you're in the process of teaching the computer. And this, the theory of this goes all the way back to the 1930s, to the Turing machine. So this is the, it's not the diagram, from the paper from Turing, it's very similar. You have the data, which is just in the Turing case, a tape of binary, uh, and you have a read-write head, which can point at a particular location and either go left, go right, change what's on the tape, depending on the description of the machine. And the seminal insight that Turing had was that the description of the machine can itself be on the tape. It can be data. And as long as you have a read-write head and a set of state registers, they can be a black box, essentially. The implementation of that bottom half is irrelevant as long as if you give it a program binary, it does the same thing to the data. So we're going to be simulating each of these components of a computer. And on your classic 8-bit machines, like the Commodore 64, you can open the computer and on the main board, you will find these chips. There is a processor, there is a memory controller, there is a video chip. So each of these are physically separate. That's not so much the case anymore. If you open up a PC, for example, you'll have like the consolidated Northbridge, for example. But this used to be the case, certainly. So we'll start off with the processor, the most important part. And we mentioned that the program binary is just a list of numbers. So here is a list of numbers for a program that would run on the Commodore 64. 169, 0, 141, 32, and so on and so forth. And each of those numbers means something to the processor that's inside the Commodore 64. And what the processor does, this is what any processor will do. It will, first of all, pull a number from a current location that it's pointing to in memory, and that will be the instruction it's going to execute next. It will go into its internal logic. It will try to work out what that number means, whether it needs any more data from the program. It will fetch bytes until it has the full instruction and then it will execute the instruction fetch decode execute and then it just it goes back to the top and it does this forever 
and we say it'll fetch an instruction byte from the place that it's pointing to in the program. Uh, the Commodore 64 processor calls that the program counter. There are a couple of other tiny little memory locations inside the processor because just because of speed of light delays. Because if you had all of these little things over in the main memory, it would take a while to get to them to get the value to bring it back. So these are actually inside the processor, so they're used all the time. So you also have the accumulator, which is just a place to store results of calculations. We have two memory offsets. We have a stack pointer and we have a few flags that indicate whether the last result of a calculation was negative, whether it was zero, something like that. So if we take the program that we just saw a few slides ago, we can break it up into how the processor would see it. So 169 means take the next byte of the program and stick that straight in the accumulator. So in this case, zero. And then 131, or in this case, hexadecimal 8D, means take the next two bytes of the program, make an address out of them, and send it out on the memory bus to be saved in memory. So in this case, the program that we saw takes the value zero, puts it in one place, takes the value one, puts it in a different place, and then does some stack magic to send you back to the basic interpreter. So how does a processor do this in general? Uh, we'll go inside the black box of the processor and we have the instruction decoder, as you might expect, which works out how uh, what the value that you just fetched means. We have the state registers, which were PC and A and X and Y and so forth. We have the arithmetic unit, which actually does the logic of, for example, addition, subtraction, loading. And we have an interface to the memory, which is where all of the things that go in and out of the processor, uh, where they come from. So if you are to emulate a processor, you want to emulate each of these little pieces. So that's what you do. You swap in some JavaScript. Your instruction decoder becomes a giant switch statement, 256 cases long. Your state registers are just an object, A, X, Y, D, C. Your arithmetic unit is a list of functions, and your average function might look like load register.a with mmu.or with the address of register.pc++ because PC automatically gets advanced every time you read a byte from the program. And then MMU, or memory management unit, I guess, is just two functions, read a byte from memory, write a byte to memory. And I left little to-dos there. We'll get to those. Because the Commodore 64 was advertised in 1982, as having 64 kilobytes of memory. That is true. But if you use all 64 kilobytes of memory, there's no way to get anything in or out of the system. So you can do calculations all day, you'll never see the results. So what the Commodore 64 allows you to do is swap in little regions of memory. So the eight kilobyte basic ROM can be swapped in or out. The disk operating system can be swapped in or out. And the input output area which is a way to connect to the various other chips that can be swapped in or out as well. And by default, these are all swapped in and you can swap them out at will. So we have to take care of that when we're emulating the MMU. So this is what MMU.or might look like. So that bottom section of memory, which is actually memory, it's just go to the giant RAM array, which is 64 kilobytes long, and pull out the index for that address. If it is an access in the basic area and basic is turned on, you don't want to return from the RAM, you want to return from the basic ROM instead. And then the only complicated section is that one which is three deep, which is you can have the RAM or you can have the character de definitions ROM or you can have the IO area. And that's the only complicated bit. And then you've got that's a nested ternary in there. So always fun when you have one of those. 
So now we have mmu.r, mmu.w is very similar. And then you have the CPU and the MMU emulated. You've got CPU.js, which is the processor, MMU.js, which is your memory access. You've got your ROM, which is a binary file, and you've got your RAM, which is just an array of zeros. Uh, we're, yeah, we're not gonna be covering sound today uh, because I don't know how to emulate sound. Always confuses me. We are gonna be covering video though because you want to be able to see stuff on the screen. And for those of you in the audience who are not aware, in the 80s, this is how you would output things onto a screen. This is from Wikipedia. Uh, and this is how a cathode ray tube works. You have a cathode in the back, you have magnetic fields which bend the cathode onto a fluorescent screen. Uh, and what will happen is there will be a dot on the screen in a particular location. And when you want to output video, you don't just want a dot in a particular location, you want a full field of things. So we do what's called scan lining or rastering, which is you scan from left to right, and then you go back to the left while turning the, the ray gun off, and then you scan left to right again. And you do this for the Commodore 64 284 times, and then you're back in the bottom right, and you go all the way up to the top left, and you do this all again. And that happens in 1 60th of a second. So that happens 60 times a second. And what that gets you is a screen area, a usable screen area of 320 by 200 pixels, which is fairly standard for like 1982, 1983. You also have a border around the edges of 42 pixels, just in case you have a television that's off center somewhat. So you can still see like the actual content of the screen. And then you have these blanking periods, these areas where the ray gun is going back from the right side to the left side, which is uh, 100 pixels from left to right to left and 28 pixels or 28 lines from the bottom right back to the top left. So you end up with an effective size of the screen with all of that extra stuff on the sides of 504 by 312 pixels. If you want to emulate that in JavaScript, you make a canvas of 504 by 312. And then you can render individual pixels and based on the X and Y position, you'll be able to work out Am I in the blanking area, in which case I don't do anything? Am I in that little border area, in which case there's a value inside the video chip that tells you which color you should show on the screen? Or are you in the screen area, in which case magic happens because there are like six different video modes for the Commodore 64 and there are sprites and there are all kinds of craziness that happens. And you call a function which does that and you get back a color that will show for that pixel. And once you've got that color for the pixel, the canvas is a 32-bit canvas. So you have to remember to add like an alpha value on the end. And then you stick those four bytes into the canvas and you have this giant array which represents the screen. You get the canvas context and ctx.push image data. You give it the whole array and it magically appears on the screen. So we mentioned that this happens 60 times a second and you can work out how many pixels it takes to do that. And it works out that for every microsecond on the actual physical Commodore 64, there are eight pixels rendered on the screen. And you'll remember from a few slides ago that uh, each of the processor instructions takes a number of microseconds to execute. Now, you're running an emulation, so you're not running on the host. You can't use the host's number of microseconds as meaning the same thing as the emulated microseconds. So what you can do is use the video chip as your main clock for microseconds. And we call that dispatch. So you draw eight pixels, by that time, you know the CPU should have executed one 
clock of an instruction. So you run the CPU for one clock. You render another eight pixels, you run the CPU for one clock again. And you just keep doing this forever and ever. So while true. And that gets you video, it gets you CPU, it gets them both lined up together. And then if you end up building sound or like interactions with the keyboard or interactions with the timers, then you can put those further down and it just all runs in that main dispatch loop. So that's just a quick uh, introduction uh, to interpretive emulation of 8-bit systems. With the example of the Commodore 64, uh, I have a tutorial series somewhere on the internet about doing this again in JavaScript for the Game Boy. Very similar process, just a slightly different processor. Uh, but that's all I have for you today. So thank you very much.